So Francis, are you there and able to share your screen? And while you do that, I'm happy to introduce you. Yes, hello, hopefully. Lovely. So um, Francis Larson is an anthropologist and historian um, and currently a Royal Literary Fund Fellow at the University of Oxford. Um, you may know her as the author of the biography of Henry Wellcome titled An Infinity of Things um, and How Sir Henry Wellcome Collected the World and a study of early British female anthropologists which came out early this year titled Undreamed Shores, the Hidden Heroines of British Anthropology and I'm sure we can put um, uh, a note of that in the chat if anybody wants to, to hear those again. Um, so without further ado I'll hand you over to Francis um, and we look forward to hearing from you. Hi, thanks. I hope everyone can hear me okay and see uh, what I can see. Um, so I can thanks. see your slides. Okay, good. <laughs> um, it's really good to be here. Um, and I'm just going to echo really what Ruth said earlier, which is that I feel like a little bit of an interloper because a very happy interloper uh, because I'm, I'm not an Egyptologist. Um, uh, but I have worked on Winifred Blackman um, through two of previous projects. One um, was my research on Welcome on Henry Welcome and his collecting habits um, and for infinity of things. And then more recently, um, she's one of five uh, women who were trained um, on the Oxford Diploma in Anthropology um, before the first world, the end of the First World War, so before 1918, um, uh, who uh, the subjects of my my book Undream Shores. So, so I'm really delighted to uh, be able to talk to you a little bit about black men who, um, as we'll find out, uh, spent many years collecting for welcome. So, um, Winifred was the eldest of five children of an Anglican vicar, uh, James Henry Blackman, um, and she spent her, really through her thirties, um, very much living the life of the daughter of the house, um, dressmaking to help pay the bills, um, making things to sell at um, church fundraising bazaars, um, going to lunch and tea parties um, with her parents' friends. Um, that was very much her, her life. Um, until uh, the end of her 30s. Um, meanwhile, so here she is. Um, meanwhile, her younger brother, Elwood, um, who was 11 years younger than her, um, grew up and went up to Oxford um, to read Egyptology and Arabic and um, went on to become a fellow of Egyptology at Worcester College, Oxford and then later professor of Egyptology at Liverpool. And um, Winifred um, was in her early thirties when, when he went up to Oxford and she was very much drawn into the subject by, by him um, and through him. Um, she, she gradually started to act as, um, as a kind of unofficial informal assistant, uh, research assistant. She would send him the latest articles um, relevant to his work while he was away excavating in Egypt. Um, she would look things up for him in books. And she started a reading group of, of female friends um, at home. Um, she started to take German lessons from a neighbor and she also started to learn Arabic from Elwood well, when he was at home. Um, and you get a sense very early on of her envy uh, for him and, and his, his life that he was embarking on as an Egyptologist. So as early as uh, 1906, when, when she's in her mid-30s and, and he's in his early 20s, um, 
you, and he has his, his first uh, field season in Egypt, excavating in Middle Egypt. Um, and he writes to Winnie, um, I do wish we could manage you next year. How I should love to have you with me. Can't you raise 50 pounds? Um, and it was also through Elwood that she got to know some of the leading academics in Egyptology and anthropology. Um, and two key ones were Francis Griffith and Charles Seligman. Um, and it's very um, moving really, because she's, she, I think around 1906 as well, she goes to visit the Griffiths, um, Francis and Frank and his, and his sister, and, and at their home in Ashton Underline, and she's just so excited as she gets two new evening dresses for this trip and um, there's letters describing her striding out, it was in winter, just striding out um, around it for walks around their house in any weather. Um, and you get this kind of sense that she's escaping domestic life for the first time really and finding herself um, as a, an independent woman. Um, and it was through Seligman and Griffith and Elwood that she uh, got onto the Diploma in Anthropology course at Oxford, um, which she started in the autumn of 1912 when she was 40. Um, the following year, her, um, her father dies suddenly and it throws the whole family into turmoil. Um, because he leaves them in debt and they um, also lose their home because they live in the vicarage. And she wrote to her Oxford tutors um, and asked them if they could help her find paid work. Um, and Henry Balfour, one of her tutors, who was curator of the Pitt Rivers Museum, um, arranged for her to start work as, a, as an assistant to him at the museum. And on the basis of this, the whole family and Elwood's job as, as fellow at Worcester College, the, the family moved to um, Oxford from Norwich. Um, and she and her brother support her mother and her other sisters and her young, youngest brother um, for the next several years. She spent um, eight years from 1912 to 1920 working basically as a cataloger um, at the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, meanwhile, her brother is, is embarking on his uh, fieldwork and research career, and um, she writes to him um, when she's at home, and you get this sense that she's living uh, through him and his experiences. She keeps a scrapbook of the postcards he sends from Egypt, um, and she writes, how I envy you with all the experiences of native life you are having. And later, uh, what a very interesting season you're having. What I would not give to have met those Bedouin, the very people I've been reading a good deal about. Do they have goats hair tents? They generally do as it throws off the water better when it rains. Do find out as much as you can about their customs. It is a unique opportunity. And after at least one uh, failed attempt to actually go to Egypt herself, um, because she fell ill at the last minute, um, in 1920, she uh, finally uh, visits for the first time, uh, joining her brother um, on one of his excavations. Um, and quickly, um, within weeks, um, embarking on her own research, um, anthropological research, in the villages um, along the Nile in, in, in Upper Egypt. And she just completely falls in love um, with the country and with the lifestyle there. Um, she writes, um, so here's some, yeah, here's some pictures of her um, in Egypt. And she writes, um, well, here we are, most comfortable and in a perfect world of delight. No pen can describe, no brush can depict the glories of this most wonderful place. Um, and she returned every year for 19 years, which is in itself quite an extraordinary achievement, particularly as she constantly struggled uh, for money. Um, she never had enough money and often didn't have enough to finish 
the current season she was in. Um, she's always begging, borrowing, saving um, all the time, borrowing from her family, um, from various academic mentors and um, funding institutions um, to really fund her love affair with, with Egypt. Um, and her letters chronicle this constant stress about finances. So um, it was a huge relief to her in 1927 when Welcome agreed to fund um, a season um, in Egypt in return for artefacts for his museum. And in the event, his grant to her was renewed, <coughs> excuse me, every year until 1933. Um, in 1927, when he first agrees to give her money, she's a very accomplished. Um, she had her diploma in anthropology from Oxford. She'd worked for many years at the Pitt Rivers Museum. She was fluent in Arabic. She'd spent six seasons in Egypt and her book, um, The Feline of Upper Egypt, was published that year to very positive reviews. She asked for £250 uh, for her season's work, which was, having gone through some of Welcome's accounts as a PhD student, a very small amount in the context of his extraordinary spending habits on his collection. Um, but he was very cautious. Um, he was very concerned about her allegiance to the Pitt Rivers, which he felt might compromise her uh, efforts for him. And he only gave her money on certain conditions, which were pretty strict, uh, pretty, you know, pretty intense. So on condition she collect for no one else, including herself um, while she was there, and she also agreed to transfer all her existing collections from Egypt, which had been obviously gathered over many years um, to him. So he took all her existing collections and she also had to submit a list in advance, initially at least, um, of everything she intended to buy for him. And having looked at some of Welcome's relationships with some of the men who uh, worked with him, I can say that this kind of incident, this kind of situation is hard to imagine uh, with if, if she'd been a man. Um, and, and as Isabel mentioned this morning, I was kind of chuckling when Isabel mentioned Frank Addison, who he employed in Sudan when he, as, as an archaeologist, when he was an engineer and a mathematician. Um, there's nothing you know, in, in Winifred's relationship with Welcome, there is nothing in, um, that compares to that kind of gentlemanly agreement that he had um, with some of the men who, who worked with him. Um, Welcome's curator, LWG Malcolm, um, kept a very close rein on her, um, checking through all her collections before agreeing to each um, from each season and they often kept her waiting months agonizing over whether she'd be able to go out to Egypt again and her letters are often quite frantic. Um, uh, also her, you can see how her own interests are slightly um, um, adapted to over the seasons to his, his desires. Um, so her first field collection is about 170 items and it gives a quite a broad overview of local life. So there's agricultural implements, there's models of water wheels, there's domestic utensils and baskets and things. But later collections for Welcome were much more confined to um, charms and medical remedies in accordance with um, Welcome's interests um, and also much greater volumes of objects. So the 1929 collection was nearly a thousand artifacts strong. Um, she tried to persuade Welcome and Malcolm to let her buy more valuable things like musical instruments and ceremonial costumes, uh, but her 
requests were either ignored or denied. Um, and it's a shame really that Wellcome didn't engage intellectually more with her, which it was true to form for him. He was really very focused on material acquisitions um, and actually felt quite threatened by intellectual interests. Um, uh, because if, if he had been more generous in that way, she might have produced more academic work as it was after her book came out in 1927. She only ever published two more articles. Um, and one was co-authored with her brother in the early 1930s. Um, she basically became one of his collecting agents, um, kind of working to try and endlessly satiate his, his need for more things. Um, in her earlier seasons, she'd covered much more um, distance, um, traveling around on a donkey from different villages, but by the 1930s, she tended to stay in her, she got, got a little flat in the suburbs of Cairo that was near a big market where she could acquire things. And she tended to spend most of her time there. And things, people would also, she was, became quite well known locally and people would come and offer her things to sell. Um, one time she writes, I literally had to push them away before I left for the end of her season. They're all desperately trying to sell her things for welcome. Um, but that said, um, Working for Welcome actually suited her quite well because her main um, desire was to just be living and working in Egypt. Um, and she shied away from applying for academic jobs. Um, earlier in 1923, she had applied for a readership in Egyptology at UCL and um, her family were, it would have paid her 600 pounds a year salary and her family were absolutely, you know, delighted by this prospect. They, she was away in Egypt at the time and they got together all her paperwork and her testimonials and got people to support her application, but she was very uh, reluctant. She constantly wrote and said, I'm not sure about this. Um, I could never give up my annual visits to Egypt. I could never take a job that would mean I, I couldn't um, visit here anymore. Um, so, and, and in the, nothing came of it. And in the event, she, she never did have a, an academic role like that. So in 1932, um, her relationship with Welcome soured um, in rather typical fashion for him because um, he discovered that she had been using some artifacts as illustrations in lectures and uh, he was not happy about this because they were meant to be in his museum um, and um, he wrote and, and claimed that all her, all her Egypt material belonged to him and could she please send it back to him, send it to him and there was a, she, she was not happy about this and said well I'm actually trying to raise money to continue my research this is a working collection it helps me to finance my work and he demanded that she transfer he agreed that it was on loan and she must transfer it back to him um, and the following year after this interaction he ceased funding her although it has to be said that in the early 1930s Welcome was in his 80s. He was surrounded by vast warehouses full of tons and tons of material. And um, he finally had started to realize that he needed to cut down on acquisition and focus on um, cataloging and sorting um, the material he already owned. So it, it was a more part of a more general um, shift in his focus away from sponsoring people in, to, to collect and work in the field. Um, so after 1933, when, when her money from Welcome stopped, um, she continued to visit Egypt every season um, until the outbreak of war, um, always relying as, as ever on 
other people to help her financially. Um, she worked on two more books, but they never saw the light of day. Um, and her letters home are increasingly, although few, fewer of them survive from the, the mid-1930s, the, the ones that do are, are more taken up with her, her domestic concerns rather than her um, academic um, work. Um, when in England, she lived uh, with her brother and her sister in Liverpool, uh, where he was professor of Egyptology. And um, during the war, their house was destroyed by a direct hit um, during the Liverpool Blitz. And they lost almost everything. I mean, the records don't go into the detail, but they moved then to North Wales and by the end of the war, 1945, she was 73. Um, and although Elwood went back um, to Egypt in the late 1940s, um, she never she never went back. Um, in a way, I almost feel like in that bombing, she lost two homes because she must have wondered if she would ever uh, visit Egypt again, and, and she didn't. Um, she died in 1950, um, six months after her beloved sister Elsie, who she was extremely close to and they'd lived together their whole lives. So I really get the sense that Blackwood was happiest in the field where she could create a, a new identity for herself and take control of her life and, and have some independence. Um, in a way that she'd never had really at home. Um, she enjoyed the great deference that she was shown there by her Egyptian friends, by her colleagues and her servants. Um, and she became quite well known in the, in the local area and amongst uh, government officials. And so she had really a, a, a freedom and an autonomy uh, that she just couldn't replicate back at home um, where she professionally had to fight for intellectual and financial recognition and um, and personally was always um, the daughter of the house um, and and in a way those two sides of her life balanced each other out and one allowed the other. Um, so I'll just finish there. Um, there's a few more photos of her in Egypt. And I'll just finish with this one again, because I just love the kind of, there's another version of this picture, which they're all paying attention <laughs> to the camera, but I love this one because she's just so spontaneous, spontaneous and she has that kind of twinkle in her eye and you just get the sense of the, the happiness and contentment that she felt when she was there. Thanks. Thank you, Francis. Um, really interesting talk. And actually, I love that through this conference today, um, so many women have taken the spotlight and um, had their moment to speak, um, especially as Winifred um, appeared to envy her brother. I like that she was finally able to join him uh, on an excavation in the 20s. Um, just have a couple of comments and, and questions for you, if you have time. Um, one of them is to ask whether or not the Blackman collection was given to the Pitt Rivers Museum in the 1980s because of her previous association with them in, the, in um, 1912, 1920. Um, do you know anything about that at all? That's a very interesting question and I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, may, maybe, may, maybe it was, I'm going to, Try and find out. <laughs> that would be Is great. There anyone from the Pitt Rivers <laughs> attending? I don't know, but if not, I'll ask them. <laughs> Thank you. And then um, Isabella um, has put in the uh, Q&A that Henry also tried to boss around Margaret Murray um, and apparently it didn't end well for him. Uh, so she's put a link if you have um, sight of that to a Twitter thread where I believe they've been talking about that and um, just some just some feedback to say that um, uh, that they have loved uh, the infinity of things um, the book you authored. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And I'm just going to see if there's anything in the chat here. So bear with me just while I'm checking as it moves. 